So uh, thank you everybody for um, joining us for our webinar. Our webinar is Owning Our Narratives, How Participatory Video Can Drive a Rights-Based Approach to the Preservation of Indigenous Languages and the Documentation of Traditional Knowledge. International Funders for Indigenous Peoples is really excited to partner with InsightShare today. So I am Ashley uh, with International Funders for Indigenous Peoples. And InsightShare is a community development organization. Their work captures the best aspects of communications technology and participatory techniques, supporting communities to explore their issues and devise solutions to, challenge, to the challenges they face. So as many of you know, the United Nations declared 2019 the Year of Indigenous Languages. We are really excited to learn from InsightShare how they use participatory video to help support um, projects around indigenous language revitalization, as well how, as how participatory video can be used for uh, self-determination. So without further ado, I would like to go ahead and introduce Nick and Grace from InsightShare. Hi guys, um, thank you for joining us. Um, in our webinar today. Before we begin, I'll just give you a quick run through of the content that we will cover today. Um, so to begin with, I will introduce today's issues, which will relate to language, culture, land and rights. And after this, Nick will share some examples. After that, we will discuss how our practice has changed over the last 20 years and the lessons we have learned. This will bring us on to Insight Share Network and our exciting Living Cultures movement. Fourthly, we will define participatory video and our rights-based approach and illustrate with examples. Um, finally, Nick will explain our theory of change and outline key recommendations for funders who wish to engage more with indigenous peoples and use our rights-based approach. Um, and we plan to finish with 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A. Um, so, we're here today to discuss the issue of language loss, which almost exclusively affects Indigenous people. But the best way to really engage with the depths of this issue is to ask, what is at stake when we talk about language loss and what are the consequences? One inherent aspect of language loss has to be the loss of culture, um, because language reflects and captures cultural practices knowledge systems and experiences. So our language embodies our communal and individual identities as well as our knowledge. This means that language loss is really symptomatic of a wider epidemic of culture loss. Language and culture loss stem from pressure on a community. Um, these pressures are diverse and they can be economic, social, political or military and they can result in erasure, displacement or homogenization. Um, and while each community's story of loss is unique, there are certain similarities. Um, one particular similarity is land loss and environmental violence. Um, so what are the links between environmental violence and language loss? It is a well-known fact that the most linguistic diversity is found in hotspots of biodiversity. So with the mass destruction of habitat, it really is no wonder that 90% of the world's languages will likely be lost by the next century. Environmental destruction really means cultural destruction. And in our current environmental crisis, this relationship should be particularly alarming. Undoubtedly, the languages that have already fallen silent have taken with them invaluable ecological knowledge. One notable trend is globalization. All too often we see ind indigenous communities displaced for economic gain and destabilized by pressure to fit a globalist worldview. So reflecting on these trends, we can see that language loss belies a host of rights abuses um, that relate to self-representation, self-determination and land. Um, now, Nick, how has this been manifest in your work? Where and in what ways do you see these issues coming together? Thanks for the introduction, Grace. You're right to point out the connection between rights-based issues. Culture and language are often connected with concerns about land and traditional territories. 
I've observed that land and traditional territories are so often at the forefront of indigenous people's concerns. The overarching goal of our partners, whether they live in Asia, Africa or the Americas, is the defense of their traditional territories. This goes hand in hand with upholding the values of reciprocity, respect, responsibility and relationship, which are also known as the original principles. The connection between traditional values and land demonstrates that culture and environment are inseparable and that land sovereignty is always at the heart of this struggle. With this in mind, I'll begin by talking about some land related issues. An overwhelming majority of our partners have experienced land rights abuses. In each instance, these abuses have unique catalysts, but roughly speaking, they're either geopolitical catalysts or climate based. Most indigenous communities and minorities within a dominant state, making them particularly vulnerable to geopolitical situations. Land grabs and forced evictions are harsh realities for many of our partners. Often our partners also face discrimination in state legal systems, leaving them at further risk of violence and abuse. In Mexico and Tanzania, for example, we've seen this in the form of state-sponsored violence and intimidation. Recently, some of our activists have experienced imprisonment, torture and abduction in their peaceful efforts to maintain cultural identity and control their traditional lands and resources. A threat facing our partners in Africa are the so-called fortress conservation practices. Baka, Batwa and Maasai have communities have been violently displaced from their traditional grazing or hunting gathering lands to make way for protected areas and are routinely abused for so-called trespassing. Participatory video has been used in both Tanzania and Cameroon to document evidence of such abuses, but also to create dialogue with conservation and political actors. Another threat is the increase in mining, logging and the development of mega projects on indigenous territories, from hydroelectric dams to wind farms, or to make room for industrial agriculture and transport infrastructure. Since we started our work 20 years ago, unfortunately, there's been an acceleration in the destruction of ecosystems in the name of development. In northern Kenya, one of the world's most profitable wind farms has affected many communities, seizing valuable grazing lands and leaving them worse off. None of the promised benefits of development, like running water, electricity, roads, or investment in health and education, none of those have been realized. The Elmolo communities on Lake Takana struggle today to survive on the dwindling fish stocks that sustain them. Without a fresh water supply, they're forced to drink the saline waters of the lake and suffer the health consequences. They receive none of the electricity generated on their lands. In Northwest Mexico, our Yaqui and Comcac partners are beset by the fossil fuels industry, dividing and displa displacing communities by laying gas pipelines illegally across their territories. All around the Yaqui villages, industrial farming complexes pollute and steal their water sources, and the Mexican government incentivizes the fishing industry, which is depleting local fish stocks. As industrialization continues to grow to historic levels, climate change and global warming impacts indigenous lands the most. Temperature increases, precip precipitation changes, and the seasonal shifts are affecting the natural systems that indigenous peoples rely on for their livelihoods. The slide showing now is from a video project from 2009 with the Maasai in Kenya, which aimed to amplify indigenous voices on climate change. The Maasai had been facing an unprecedented drought and their precious herds were decimated. Videos like this were a powerful wake up call at the time because policymakers and the public in the northern industrialized countries were still relatively unaffected by climate impacts. So to summarize, the threat to land, to land rights occurs on two fronts, on a national geopol geopolitical scale and on a global climate-based scale. The next slide shows an impact report we produced that tracks and evaluates participatory video projects on climate change with eight indigenous communities who lived in a range who live in a range of ecosystems from forests and highlands to small islands from the Arctic to the, to the African savanna. So clearly indigenous peoples frequently suffer land rights abuses, but for these same partners, where does land intersect with culture and language? As you pointed out, the loss of land and instability in the environment can lead to the erasure of identity. Language loss is the key indicator in this kind of cultural endangerment. One instance where we saw the interconnection of land, culture and language was in Cameroon, working with the Baka. 
Living in the southeastern rainforest of Cameroon, the back are on the front line of climate change. They suffer drought, which impacts fishing and agricultural yield, as well as issues affecting access to the forest because of conservation. The backer use PV, I'm going to, I'm going to say PV for short for participatory video. Uh, they use PV as a tool for both documenting the effect of climate change on the forest and for recording their relationship with the forest. To do this, the backer created a PV film called Facing Changes in African Forests and produced a series of video dictionaries. This was the first ever video dictionary that I know of. The film documents how climate change alters the forest and impacts the backer, while the video dictionaries explore how the backer relate to the forest on a cultural level. Both film and dictionaries are interrelated. The backer rely on and live in the forest, and in turn, it shapes their culture and their language. Without the forest, the backer people can't survive. Working in northeast India in Nagaland and Meghalaya, where this photo was taken, we also saw how culture is affected by the relationship to the land. A Naga elder described the changes in his community since the evangelical missionaries came to preach their worldview, accelerating the erasure of an ancient way of life and thus weakening the traditional forms of governance. Ultimately, this has resulted in the privatization of land and water resources and in the dwindling cultivation of traditional crops like millet. A woman led local organization called Northeast Network chose to use participatory video to document the traditional harvest of millet. As a result of this video, countless elements of Naga culture were revived. Folk and field songs previously banned by the church were sung again. Traditional garments were remade and traditional meals were cooked. In this project, which aimed to rejuvenate traditional land management practices, ultimately, a host of other traditional cultural practices were also rejuvenated. This again demonstrates a link between land and culture. We learned from the Baka and tried using video dictionaries as a tool for reviving endangered languages in northern Kenya recently when working with the El Molo. I wrote, I wrote about this work in the spring edition of IFIP's newsletter, so if you haven't read it yet, please look out for that. It's a fascinating case study. The way in which the El Molo lost their language is quite unique. There was a smallpox epidemic that caused large numbers of Samburu people to come to the El Molo villages, and eventually the El Molo were assimilated and began to speak Samburu. But the impact of language loss is quite universal and strikingly emotional. When I interviewed him in Loingalani last month near Lake Tukana, Michael Basili, the chair of the Gurupau um, community organization, told me, we need to have our language back as a matter of pride, because if we don't have our language, we're forever dependent on others. Just like a slave, we are nobody. Language and culture makes you somebody. So these are some of the rights-based issues facing our partners today dual acts of suppressing traditional knowledge and systematically stripping indigenous communities of their lands and assets are about removing agency. This is the ultimate conclusion of the process of colonization. So you've clearly been working with these issues for a long time. In fact, this year is Insight Share's 20th anniversary. So can you tell us how your practice has changed in this time and what lessons you've learned? Yes, yeah, sure. I'd just like to begin by mentioning the slide that's showing now. Here we see an elder from the Gamo Highlands in Ethiopia teaching his grandchildren to use the camera. We have a motto at Insight Share, which is each one teach one, because a great way to learn a new skill is to, is to have to teach it to someone else. In this way, the camera gets passed around the community. Everyone gets their hands on the camera because PV aims to demystify the technology. And we teach this, the, the camera skills through fun games and exercises so that literally anyone can have a go. Before I discovered PV, I was a self-trained filmmaker. My interests led me to live and work in remote locations, places like Nepal, Kazakhstan, Zimbabwe. I learned to appreciate other ways of seeing and being in the world. I call these alternative paradigms to the dominant Western mindset. And I recognize both their value and the threat imposed by an increasingly globalized world. I also gained insights from these extended visits into what makes a community resilient. On TV, in the media, across the development sector, people still tend to ventriloquize on behalf of others. I still find this frustrating. Telling people's stories as an outsider just didn't feel right to me anymore. So gradually, learning to let go of control, I handed over the camera. 
In doing so, I realized that PV is a far more compelling approach to storytelling and the process itself can also be cathartic, healing and empowering for all involved. I joined forces with my brother, who's an anthropologist by training. Insight shares early clients were research institutes who hired us to make videos with local communities to consult them on natural resource management issues. Our agenda was to go beyond the consult con consultation box ticking exercise and try to disrupt the hierarchies prevalent in academia and research to challenge why the real experts, i.e. local people, are never invited to speak at conferences and rarely, if ever, have a say in policymaking. We saw an opportunity for, for participatory video, not only to amplify unheard voices, but to interweave scientific knowledge with traditional ecological knowledge to enable better decision making and better project design around climate change and the management of uh, natural resources. At that time, we were also being offered small one off grants to carry out projects by um, the UNDP small grants program and others. But it was often frustrating for our participants who were eager to continue using the tool of video as there was no return visit and no resources to buy equipment to leave behind. Real change usually takes months and years, not weeks. So we recognized there was a more encompassing role we could play to facilitate the process of change. We also started to train indigenous facilitators to do our job, to train other indigenous groups. And we equipped local media hubs, hubs with their own cameras, laptops, projectors, and solar panels so that communities could take ownership of the process. Our big break came in around 2009 with the Conversations with the Earth program. And you can see the map of the communities we worked with during that program. We received a multi-year grant from the Christensen Fund and support from other foundations, which we used to establish a network of grassroots media hubs supporting local teams of indigenous filmmakers reporting on the impacts of climate change. We organized an activist gathering at the Copenhagen Climate Talks and a major exhibition at the National Museum in Copenhagen followed by major gatherings and events across the US. This eventually led to an international family of PV hubs, as you can see from the map, many of whom we're still connected with today. PV enabled these communities to share experiences connecting indigenous people's struggles across continents and to campaign for action and bring their concerns to the international slide stage. With our partners, we created Conversations with the Earth's Travelling Multimedia Exhibition, launched at the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian in Washington, DC. By, by 2012, the videos had been watched by over 2 million people. The creation of community authored videos on common themes has the capacity to inspire, celebrate and affirm. Seeing indigenous knowledge writ large, getting attention, gaining traction on a global stage has sparked new PV collectives around the world, including La Marabunta Filmadora in northern Mexico, who, amongst other things, are fighting a campaign against the gas pipeline. Uh, Oltilo Lamar in Tanzania, a Maasai PV collective, collective fighting land rights violations and promoting uh, girls' education. Uh, there's Northeast Network, who I've mentioned before, in Nagaland, promoting traditional food production methods and women farmers and enterprises. And, and Ugurupao, the Omolo organization in northern Kenya, tackling cultural taboos and corrupt land practices and language endangerment. These seeds are taking root, growing steadily towards our collective vision, a living cultures movement. Um, so can you explain why you established Insight Share Network? What is its purpose and how did it lead to living cultures? Sure. So between 2012 and 2016, I developed more in-depth relationships with some of our partners. Over this period, I've really been guided by um, books I've read and a phrase in particular coined by the anthropologist and post-development thinker Arturo Escobar, which is the principle of cooperation towards autonomy. During that time, our indigenous partners, supported by Insight Share, developed local and autonomous video collectives to be used in the preservation of culture. In particular, in, in particular they prioritised language, customs and local food systems as well as advocacy campaigns, such as the land rights struggle of the Maasai. In response to their requests for long-term support, Insight Share has incorporated a not-for-profit organization 
called Insight Share Network, specifically to support indigenous communities to harness the power of PV as a vehicle for systemic change. This slide and the last one uh, show a snapshot of a drawing made to document our retreat in 2017 with our Maasai, Naga, Yaki and Comcac partners in the UK, where we agreed on a common mandate. The key points I want to share about the network are the motivation to increase autonomy and control in the hands of Indigenous partners, the goal to scale out a sustainable Indigenous to Indigenous training model, and that the network represents our efforts to decolonize our mode of operating. Insight Share Limited is a social enterprise. Income for pay from pay for services contributes to the mix of grants and donations. The Indigenous hubs are following the sustainable model. They provide free training to Indigenous groups in return for food and lodging, but they charge non-Indigenous clients for PV workshops and training. For example, in Canada, First Nations PV trainee, trainees will be paid by the government to monitor climate and pollution impacts and to train other communities to do this. In 2019, we want to continue supporting the emerging hubs and video collectives in India, Canada, Mexico, Cameroon, South Africa, Namibia, Tanzania, and Kenya. So what are the challenges you overcame by establishing the network? We avoid short-term projects. We make multiple visits to strengthen capacity and we always provide equipment. We protect communities from being driven by outside agendas. We ensure that resources are available to support long-term local change on their terms. We're pioneering a sustainable model for local hubs as a social enterprise. Our own, con our own consultancy model enabled us to invest in our core mission. Our social enterprise employs indigenous facilitators as a way of supporting their livelihoods and strengthening their capacity. We address issues of trust in the communities we work with by organizing ceremonies to hand over equipment publicly to local elders. Indigenous women often lack social mobility, so we're actively opening spaces and opportunities for women through PV. And we support intergenerational work. We've seen how video and computer technology acts as a hook to encourage and revive young people's interest in culture to, 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 and to encourage youth to speak and seek out information from their elders. Finally, most of our Indigenous facilitators today are women and youth. So you facilitate communities in using artistry video or PV. Um, can you just quickly outline what PV is? Sure. Participatory video or PV is a community engagement and development tool that involves participatory story creation, video production, screening, sharing and campaigning. It's a co-creative process that can help activists to motivate their wider communities to create and shape their own narratives. I'm now going to read out the following slides which aim to describe PV in a nutshell. PV is a set of techniques for communities to explore their own issues and bring about positive change. Participants join the process as representatives of their community. Community concerns are shared, prioritised and investigated by the participants. Facilitators support the group to learn simple video production skills through games and exercises. And we also share all kinds of analytical tools uh, such as mapping, problem trees, rivers of life. So lots of complementary activities and, and tools that they use alongside the video skills. Participants work together to collectively devise, plan and produce their videos. Video is used for communication between the community and their chosen audiences. So what do you use PV to achieve? Um, Right, well, PV has the ability to restore local ecosystems, harmonize social relationships, resolve conflict even in dark times, and heal rifts and trauma. It can support a purposeful journey towards regaining collective mental health and well being through developing a deep connection between place, people, and culture. PV is the most impactful tool we've found in advocating for Indigenous peoples because of its medium and method. The medium is audiovisual, and the method at its core is participatory and collective. So the agenda is set by Indigenous peoples themselves rather than imposed. The leader of the Yaki Video Hub, 
in Mexico said, I don't know if PVs was, PV was designed by indigenous peoples, but it works very well here. The benefit of medium and method is evident at two levels. The first level is the community level and the second is policy level. To work through this, I'll begin by outlining the benefit of the medium. As the video suggests, PV is an audio visual tool. Visual and audio tools are well suited to the communities we work in. They capture the heart and essence of oral traditions that make up the cultural, linguistic and historical identities of many of these communities. It's worth pointing out that most of the people we train in PV have never touched a camera or computer before. Many of them are also non-literate and they find video an appropriate means of documentation and communication. In terms of language and cultural revival, PV can go so much further than the written word. With PV, language can be heard, culture can be seen, and all this is experienced in a communal way. Talk of the communal brings me on to PV's method. As I've said, the most fundamental element of PV is that it is participatory. At each level of the filming process, community members plan execute, edit and disseminate the footage collectively. The process emphasises the notion of the collective, which is central to cultural and linguistic, linguistic identity. At the same time, PV empowers the individual. Through interview, it amplifies some of the most muted voices and gives them an equal platform. And we've seen this to be the case with elders, women and youth. The slide showing now shows a group of our partners from across three continents speaking together at a science symposium on climate change in Washington, D.C. a few years ago. Being interviewed on camera can really help a person for this kind of public speaking opportunity. These same elements make PV the most impactful tool for affecting policy, for interacting with authorities and for establishing rights. For example, the Bakker in Cameroon have used PV to support a new generation of leaders to build their skills. They record presentations and play these back to help with confidence and to deepen their knowledge on key issues so that the community representatives can better defend Bakker rights. When we first started working with this group, there really was just one person who had that kind of confidence to represent the entire Bakker community. And now there are many more. So the organisation Okani credits PV for having put their organisation on the map in Cameroon and for raising the number of elected BACA representatives in local councils from just three members to 18 members. The use of video technology like PV is central to furthering cultural and social transformations for Indigenous people. Taking control of mediums that have the power to communicate across time and distance challenges notions of who has the right to know, to tell and circulate. With PV, Indigenous peoples have the have been able to insert themselves into national and international narratives and become self-representing stakeholders in global conversations. This brings into focus a rights-based approach that champions the rights of all Indigenous peoples to self-determination, culture and land. PV brings representation into the hands of Indigenous peoples and is a platform for Indigenous peoples to articulate their rights. In this slide, we see Martina and Irma from Peru answering questions after showing videos to a diverse audience of activists and policymakers. Screenings are a key part of the process. They provide a safe space for dialogue and exchange. Most screenings occur actually within the community locally, where the video rough, rough cuts are shown, sometimes to you know, many hundreds of people. And everyone can participate and provide guidance in the creation of future videos through the screenings. So why do you think that PV has this rights-based approach um, and why is this a virtue? Well, a rights-based approach is built on the core values of accountability, participation and empowerment. These values are also central to PV. So a rights-based approach towards PV involves harnessing the full potential of these values to realise rights. First of all, participation. This allows communities to decide for themselves what stories to tell in their pursuit of rights. It brings a conversation of rights into the context of the community and grounds it in the realisation of rights for and by those people. Participation also allows each person to articulate what the realisation of rights looks like for them and for the collective. It reveals those rights that can be easily identified within a community's unique belief and value, belief systems and values and, and their own behaviours. So that we're not imposing a sense of, of, of rights onto communities. We, we, we seek to, um, to help them articulate what we refer to as 
their home known rights. Next, empowerment. The process of PV empowers participants to lay claim to their rights and to actively seek out their realization. PV empowers participants to self-determine and the right to self-determination is the cornerstone of, of UNDRIP, that is the UN Declaration of Indigenous Peoples. Participants choose diverse narratives to focalize, but the process of PV naturally realizes articles of UNDRIP. For example, article three and four on self-determination. Article five on the right to strengthen and maintain distinct social, economic, political and cultural institutions. Article 18 on the right to participate in decision making. Article 26, the right to traditionally owned land and resources. In terms of Article 8, the right to maintain traditional knowledge, practices and lifestyles. In other words, the right not to be assimilated. PV is a brilliant tool because it demonstrates how other rights abuses, like the right to land and territories, actually impact Article 8. They're all interconnected. As we know, dispossession of land robs Indigenous peoples of their culture and collective voice. So PV natural, naturally complements the elements of UNDRIP that can be used to directly address other rights. And we view this as really critical when more than 10 years since the declaration, environmental abuses have, if anything, worsened and threats have escalated as the traditional custodians of biodiversity, uh, bicultural diversity, face increasingly increasing danger to their lives. Now on accountability. One crucial stage in the process is identifying the duty bearers, i.e. who is accountable for protecting, respecting and fulfilling these rights. Well, video is a great way of talking to authorities. The clear demonstration and articulation of issues by the community itself creates a direct line of dialogue between duty bearers and rights holders. Finally, I just want to explain the difference between overt and covert. The struggle for rights can often be confrontational and pose a threat to those who challenge rights abuses. Undercover video is often used by activists, for example, to expose rights abuses, but this can be so dangerous. PV offers an alternative. PV is overt. It naturally encourages dialogue and positive engagement, which often diffuses tension. It seeks to engage all stakeholders in a dialogue and find a common solution. By being candid in its overtness, PV is non-confrontational. The Maasai, for example, describe PV as a polite way to engage with government about their land issues. And we, we view this as a benefit to our rights-based approach. I think it often yields better results over the long term. And what is your theory of change? The engine for our theory of change is participation. Without participation, there exists no active citizenship, no engagement, no agency, and no access to decision making. The assumptions underlying our theory of change are that developing skills through PV, decolonizing our approach, i.e. systematically ensuring that indigenous people are in the lead and network indigenous media hubs will address these issues. We've already spoken at length about the inputs of training in PV. We believe training indigenous facilitators and connecting indigenous communities across continents are a key driver indigenous -led, of indigenous led change. In addition, ensuring that there's a progression route to enable PV teams to continuously improve their professional development as filmmakers, as community development leaders, as active voices on the global stage. This is vitally important to ensure that their voices are truly amplified and impactful. So with these inputs, we should generate two key outputs. Firstly, an autonomous, sustainable, indigenous-led network of community media hubs uh, in biodiversity hotspots, interconnected, confident and committed to leading their own development. Secondly, a network of skilled indigenous facilitators trained in advocacy skills, leading the way in training others and developing shared narratives across borders. In terms of impact, we measure at three levels. I'll illustrate these through the examples. First of all, the individual impacts. We've heard so many powerful transformation stories, particularly from youth and women. For example, Kabali, a single mother from the Gabra tribe in northern Kenya, told me last month that she used to be a housewife, but thanks to her PV training, she's now regarded as a household name. Across all the projects we've seen, how elders now trust the youth and share their secret practices and rituals so, so that the culture is kept alive. And PV has provided social mobility to women and youth through opportunities to gain a passport, to travel internationally, but also through gaining the respect of elders for their role in documenting important practices that are being lost and forgotten. 
Now community impacts. Some examples. In Tanzania, PV has enabled the Maasai people to block a 1,500 kilometer square land grab from a private hunting com company. In Northwest Mexico, the Yaqui community used PV to expose corruption and generate funds to recondition their water distribution. And the Comcap community have used PV to raise awareness and find a solution to overfishing. And in Northeast India, one video documented the last farmer growing millet in his village, which through screening the video led to 150 families growing millet the following year. In the process of reviving a traditional farming practice, much more was revived. 20 forgotten folk and field songs were recorded. 10 traditional recipes and handicrafts were, were also revived. This process of regeneration catalyzed a much larger cycle of remembrance and reinvigoration. A quote from our partner in Nagaland captures this well. Through PV, we're using new ways to achieve love and peace, to conserve the land, seeds and water. PV can bring forth the insights needed for lasting change because it has validity in the wider community. And now the policy impacts. In Tanzania, government investment in school in girls' schools, girls' schooling has increased as a result of a video made by the Maasai. And girls' en enrollment has increased exponentially. In Ghana, uh, customary practices that discriminated against widows, causing them to lose their land when their husbands died, are now being stopped due to a participatory video project there. One could argue that compared to 10 years ago, indigenous peoples are now much more in the forefront of climate activism around the world and their role as custodians of biodiversity is finally being recognized. However, we must recognize that policy impacts are pretty hard to quantify and usually require multiple strategies and often take years to take effect. Anyhow, with these kinds of impact, our final goal is in sight, which is indigenous communities have the means, skills and opportunities to ignite and unite their voice for change in local, national and international conversations and decision making processes governing their futures. Um, so, Nick, to summarise, what next? What is your vision? Well, we're in the process of nurturing the next generation of leaders, enabling peer to peer mentoring and training, raising the profile of otherwise hidden struggles. This, combined with sharing our expertise in amplification, targeted distribution, social media training, running events and campaigning to bring local issues to a global stage. So over the next two years, we wish to equip dozens of indigenous women and men with the powerful tools and leadership skills. Together, we'll seed and incubate new community video hubs in the most critically important and endangered biodiversity regions. Each one will be interconnected, locally owned and managed. Within 10 years, we hope to see thousands of change makers across the world harnessing the incredible social impact of participatory video as a tool for positive change. And can you quickly run through how funders can engage? Sure, here's a few recommendations for funders. Firstly, we recommend developing a collaborative approach. Identifying partners in the territories that, that are either indigenous led or have a long track record of working with indigenous peoples and building relationships over time is key to managing risk. The more you collaborate as equals, the better you get to know one another. This will build mutual trust and understanding. Uh, we find that retreats and gatherings are very important in building these uh, relationships. In terms of risks to grantees, language rights are an inextricably linked to rights concerning culture, resources and territory. However, where projects are led by indigenous activists, they will have their own ways in which to assess and address risk. Working together, using their knowledge and practices can build confidence on both sides. For example, when our Maasai partners were threatened with, the, with arrest, um, we worked with Avaz, the global campaigning community, to provide the best lawyers and local backup for them. Next, digital security and publicity. As part of looking at risk, reporting and profiling of supported projects need to take account of the impact of publicity, local, regional, national and international, on the individuals and communities involved. In the case of the living culture strategy, for instance, the language used to describe each project or action is carefully and thoughtfully selected so that the potential for ongoing dialogue and safe engagement is prioritised. It is also why, for example, we made last minute changes to a big screening event in London recently, 
Our partners asked us to remove one of the videos and one of the speakers from the bill to lessen the risk of arrest back home. So we were able to do that. Next, um, we support indigenous led initiatives. Immediate priorities may not be as obvious to us as external agencies and the logical strategy behind them may have developed in response to events or happenings that have already had an impact locally, positive or negative. For example, the living culture strategy is developing to find a, a different way in which to engage with decision makers that is uniting communities that have been fractured because of the constant struggles over territory. Here's an example of what I mean by the living culture strategy. The Yaqui team in Mexico have decided to create a documentary to address the issues that surround the sacred deer dance and how modern life is affecting it. The deer dance is considered to be the pillar of the Yaqui culture. It's one of the most renowned traditions across Mexico. Preparation for the documentary has included over 50 interviews. The rough draft has been screened in Yaqui territory to receive feedback and to make final adjustments and changes. The documentary explores the economic, cultural, ecological, social, sacred, commercial, folkloric and identity facets of the deer dance. The team decided to work on creating unity amongst the Yaqui to counter the corruption of some, some of their traditional authorities and the ongoing abuses from the Mexican government. After all, with unity comes strength. So instead of discussing what went wrong and looking for scapegoats or fighting the enemy, they decided to go back to the roots of Yaqui culture to use the oral tradition, beliefs and teachings of the elders to create videos that celebrate their living culture. So as Annabella, <clears throat> the Yaqui leader, has said, no one can argue or criticize the teachings of the elders and the ancestors. No one would dare to deny or consider them incorrect. So the idea is to make people proud of their culture and acknowledge how their ancestry shed blood to protect it, the land included. Through this, they aim to transcend the trouble and strife caused by fighting isolated battles against the um, oil industry and uh, local government and industrial farming. Now um, I'm going to now let's address uh, barriers to funding. There are institutional barriers. A lot of um, indigenous groups do not have. Um, legal entities uh, that can accept uh, funders funding so it's important to support them with capacity building to help help them establish themselves um, next it's important we think that funders uh, priorities are actually articulated by the communities themselves so are there are there other ways in which to receive funding proposals that are not dependent on written applications that can demonstrate a truly consultative approach for example video proposals PV can provide a means to do this if communities were already trained and we have several examples of this for example after an insight share workshop with the backer in Cameroon they submitted a video proposal to plan Cameroon and received a $40,000 uh, grant support for individuals sometimes individuals are um, are often uh, are deemed ineligible for funding but it, there's often the need to support them to do research or travel or study and this could be key to developing um, stronger networks and developing leadership within communities. Um, flexible, creative and responsive, res responsive funding paths. In unstable parts of the world, unexpected change can happen fast and require an immediate response. How can we find a way to fast track support to those people that uh, are facing these kinds of uh, sudden challenges? And finally, participatory approaches to grant making. This isn't a new phenomenon in the grant making world, but we can go further by exploring new ways of working with communities at the grassroots as part of the consultation process in determining and designing grant making programs. And yeah, we think participatory video could play a role in this. In terms of eva eva evaluation metrics, are, are there more participatory ways of defining success? How can we work collaboratively to define what success looks like to different stakeholders? There's an approach we use called the most significant change technique, which we combine with participatory video. It's a fantastic approach based on storytelling, and that's a great way to foreground participants' perspectives of change and success. Tracking change throughout a project need not end with the project. Change takes time, and often positive impacts happen long after a project is completed. How can we make interventions that are longitudinal? So I think with that, we'll. Um, bring this talk to an end.
um, and we can address uh, a question which came up. The question was, um, have we worked with children? So this came up when we gave this talk earlier in the week. And uh, the answer is yes, we have worked with children um, on a number of projects. I mean, children are always involved in, in all of our projects uh, in various ways, but um, there have been some projects where we've focused on training uh, teams of children as participatory video, uh, as community filmmakers. One example is in Cunayala in Panama. Um, we worked with school children in Cunayala and they made a video uh, addressing the issue of rubbish and waste. Uh, they live on small islands in the Caribbean and gradually as uh, as more sort of th the throwaway culture has reached their, their islands and they, they are increasingly consuming plastics and, um, and other items and throwing, throwing them in the sea. They don't have a waste disposal um, approach. So the young people made a video uh, highlighting their concerns around the, you know, the increase of plastic rubbish blocking up the rivers and, and um, watercourses. And they showed this to the traditional council, the Kuna council, this video, and they managed to persuade the council to, um, to make a new law banning the use of plastic bags from, the, from Kuna territories. So that was pretty awesome. Um, oh, finally, I'd just like to show, make, make you aware of these resources. They're free resources available on our website. Uh, Insight Share. Oh, I think we've actually written the wrong address on that slide. I'm sorry about that. It's insightshare.org stroke resources. And uh, you'll see a bunch of toolkits and guides that um, have been produced over the last 10 or so years. Um, and yeah, they're really good. Um, so do have a look at those if you want more information. And feel free to get hold of, to, to contact me if you've got any questions or would like to discuss anything in particular. My name's Nick Lunch. I'm a co-director of Insight Share and the director of Insight Share Network. And I can be reached uh, by email uh, on nlunch at insightshare.org. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank, thank you, you uh, Nick and Grace, for um, taking the time to present to um, IFEP's members today. We really appreciate it. It was really wonderful to learn how participatory video um, not only supports language revitalization projects, but how it can capture many important issues to Indigenous people by elevating their narratives, and how this is a powerful tool to advocate for rights, including those enshrined in UNDRIP. So thank you so much again for taking the time to present to us. And we really appreciate it. Thank you, you two. Thank you thank so much you. to IFIT for setting this up and uh, hosting the webinar. Really appreciate it as well. Thank you.